بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the door, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's presentation is new to our lecture series in multiple ways. First of all, it is a new topic to our lecture series entitled, there you have it, The City of Paradise, Qariyat al Fau, an emporium between classical and Islamic world. It deals with a city, a pre-Islamic site in Central Arabia. Khariyat al-Fau was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Kinda, which played a crucial role in the development of uh, Islamic culture. Strategically positioned at the crossroads of the major powers of its time, this city in this respect, relates to the Dar's current exhibition, Arabia Felixia, Felix and Rome, a passage across three seas. As the title indicates, this cross-cultural approach is also new. Dar al Athar Islamia is honored to present a new participant in our lecture series. Dr. Juan de Lara is an archaeologist, art historian, and digital engineer with a base in London. He holds a position of fellow at the UCL, which is the University College in London, Institute of Archaeology, and is associate researcher at the University of Oxford in the Khalili Research Center. Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Dr. Dilara is also director of the Armenian Institute in London. Dr. Dilara's academic exper expertise encompasses extensive research in the archaeology of the ancient and late antique Mid Mid Mediterranean and Near East. Additionally, he has delved into the development of Islamic cultures. His scholarly pursuits aim to comprehend and substantiate the continuity of late antiquity within the Islamic world, shedding light on the cross-cultural networks of flourished among societies during this period. Currently, Dr. Dilara is engrossed in a research project in a research project focused on the culture of Qariyat al Fau, a significant mercantile emporium. Beyond this research, he has amplified his skilled he has applied sorry his skills to the digital reconstruction of various sites worldwide including the Ac Acropolis of Athens and the city of al Kharum of Afghanistan. Currently, he has been concerned with the development of early Islamic culture. His scholarly pursuits aim to comprehend and substantiate the continuity of late antiquity within the Islamic world, particularly on the cross-cultural networks that flourished among the societies during this period. Dr. Dilara's immediate research project focuses on the culture of Qariya al -Fau. This is a new area of study that has long been neglected. While Dr. Dilara is focusing on al -Fau, let us focus on you turning your mobile phones and let's welcome Dr. Juan de Lara. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Albaijan. And of course, I have to thank Her Excellency Sheikha Hassa Al Sabah for her kind invitation to participate in this lecture series. And of course, I have to thank as well Salama Kaugi for organizing my visit here to Kuwait. And I have to thank Dana. BJ, uh, Walid, 
and the rest of the wonderful team here at the museum, at, at the collection. I love the fact that as uh, Dr. Albayan was presenting, suddenly the face of uh, Abdul Rahman Al Ansari uh, sort of appeared um, to make his presence. I will talk a little bit more about him in a minute. This evening, I want to transport you back on time to one of the most opulent cities of the ancient Arabian world, yet unknown to many. Indeed, the study of Arabia is one of the biggest unknowns when we compare it to their historical neighbors. Let's think about ancient Greece, or Rome, or Egypt, or Mesopotamia. Imagine the amount of publications that have come across um, these topics. Yet, Arabia still needs to further develop its research. There are many reasons, most of them are stereotypes of, for why this happened. One of them, perhaps, is the condition of nomadic people inhabiting Arabia. Therefore, the lack of settlements and the lack of material culture. Perhaps even the hostility of the tribes, that's the one I was trying to find. Quarrying and warring uh, institutions that were not allowing for the creation of culture. Or indeed, we have as well the deserted land of Arabia, not allowing for any new city to, 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 to appear. The other is perhaps that Alexander the Great did not man manage in his expansionist campaigns to conquer Arabia. Indeed, he died in Babylon in the year 323, just before his, uh, he returned, just after he returned from India, and he was about to enter Arabia Felix. The city in question I want to talk today about is Qariyat al Fao. It encompasses five years of research in which I, I purposely said to myself I need to find access to all the material that Dr. Abdul Rahman Al Ansari, the original excava excavator of the site, had published. He had done approximately seven uh, seasons, and only one of them in 1982 was published. Across, along my colleagues at uh, different universities, we realized that there was still a lot of material that we needed access. So I set myself the mission this year to go and meet Al Ansari in Saudi and try to get access to the unpublished uh, records. Unfortunately, I did not manage to meet Al Ansari. He passed away uh, earlier this year. But I was fortunate enough to have the Heritage Commission of Saudi Arabia to help me to get access to six volumes. Uh, which allowed me to really study the content and the material culture and have a new perspective of the site. Now, this project, the art of Qariyat al Fao, has become a, a research proje uh, project at the Halili Center at Oxford University. And I was happy yesterday I was at Saudi, in Saudi Arabia also presenting on the topic. And hopefully we're, we're in the way of, of producing a new book with new material and new photographies. Just to, I, I think uh, Dr. Albaijan did a wonderful presentation and summary of what Qariyat al Fao is. Uh, it's a city in, the central, in Central Arabia. It uh, was a significant commercial hub uh, for more or less the year from 400 BC to the year 400 AD. And of course, there are many things that make it a very special city. The first, perhaps, is that it's where the oldest inscription uh, with old Arabic language was found. This keeps changing because we keep finding new, uh, new petroglyphs with different languages, but still the city holds importance for this reason. We also found, have found probably the earliest name of Allah, um, as well in Qariyat al Fao. And it is the historical homeland of the warrior poet Imru al Khais. For today's journey, I will explain a little bit more about the city and I will try to also study the impact that it had in the very early Islamic uh, dynasties. And I also will incorporate some images from the collection because I think it's such a wonderful thing that you have access and to, to, to many objects that are related indirectly to Qariyat al Fao, but it's such an asset and a treasure for Kuwait. So I hope that it will help me to illustrate my, my narrative. For those of you who do not know where Qariyat al Fao is, it's in Central Arabia. It's in the road, uh, actually I have here a pointer. It's in the road that goes from Nashran, passing all the way up to Gerha, a commercial hub of the late antique world. It also went from the southern part of the peninsula all the way up 
to the Mediterranean, to Gaza, and to the Egyptian world. I'm not going to expand too much right now on the trade routes, but I want to emphasize that in the early period of Qaret al Fau, it was part of the Ma'in state until the fall of the kingdom in 25 BC. Then in the first century BC, it transformed from a small caravan passing a station into a large emporium and commercial hub. And that's when it was actually adapted uh, and it became somehow connected to the kingdom of Kinda. We don't know if it was the capital because there is Ramar al Kinda, which is another city of, uh, which, which holds it that same position. It either was a capital or it was a commercial capital. Here on the screen, you can see what the city looks now like today. The first people who became interested in the site were the employees of Aramco in 1940s. And then in between 1950s and the 60s, you have uh, figures like Jacques and Gonzague Rickmans, Philippe Lippens, Albert Jam, and uh, even uh, Abdullah Filbe visiting the site. In the year 67, the King Saud University began research in Karet al Fao, and it was in 1972 when Abdul Rahman al Ansari began the formal excavations uh, in the site. I think this image represents or shows a bit better the current condition of Karyat al Fao, and uh, you also can see uh, the mountain Jabal al Tuwaik uh, at, uh, at the background, and at the top, uh, top left corner, you will see the beginning of the Rub al Khali. In fact, this gorge is the one that is called Al Fao, from where the city takes its modern name. But don't be misled. This used to be a verdant oasis in antiquity. In fact, the ancient South Arabian inscriptions tell us about the old name of the city, which was That al Janan, or the city of paradise, the city of gardens, probably evoking the greenery and lush uh, palm trees that existed here. Another name of the city was Qariyat uh, Kahl, in, the in honor of the tutelary god of, of the town Kahl, or Kahil. I was very happy to discover two days ago that there is a small bead with an inscription, Jat Kahal, at the Al Sabah collection. And so it probably this bead comes from the larger world of Qarit al Fao. And it probably is a personal name with a, a, a theonym of, of, of the god Kahal. Another of the names was uh, Qariyat al Hamra, or the Red City, evoking those red palaces that once may have stood. Uh, in this oasis. And if we were to try to imagine how it looked in ancient times, it probably would have been something like this. It's, of course, a hypothetical reconstruction, but I hope that it shows you and it evokes this, the, 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 the city when it was at the skirts of the wonderful mountain, holy mountain behind it. I have also taken, there are some pictures from Oasis in Oman that I think help us to visualize what this, the site must have looked like when the aquifers and the wells were operative. It is believed that the site stopped existing sometime in the year 400 AD. We don't know very well why, it, but we know that the, the springs had dried by then. So there probably was a slow movement of people. It's also possible that they had to be relocated in the area of Hadramaut in the south of Arabia. Or it's also possible that they were incorporated by the Himyar, uh, the kingdom of Himyar from Yemen. Of course, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of commercial trade for Qarit al Fao. It acted as a bottleneck in between uh, two major trade routes one that does this uh, axis that you see here, and another one that would be this one going up to the Gulf and to Mesopotamia. Uh, most of the material that, we, that was imported and traded from Qarit al Fao came from the south. It was the spices, cinnamon, frankincense, mostly luxury goods. And we also may have had material coming from the broader Mediterranean world, down from uh, passing through Qarit al Fao, through the Lycianites or the Nabataeans at different uh, times in history, all the way uh, up to the harbors of the south and being taken elsewhere. Also, probably India. There are two historical phases of development in Al Fao. The first phase is the one of the South Arabian substratum. Here on the screen, you can see a number of incense burners and altars from the Minians. The, the Minians were a kingdom extremely involved in trade. We can find Minian inscriptions in the Aegean in Greece. 
And these inscriptions are offerings to their local gods of the Minaeans, to Wat. And it shows the extents of their trade routes up to the, the year 25 BC. We also find a sarcophagus in Egypt with inscriptions of a priest that was trading on, with spices. And we find also from the, in the Red Sea, if you try to imagine a line that goes from the Red Sea to the Nile, there are several petroglyphs uh, written in Minean. So extensive trade happening by this population. I also want to show one piece in the Al Sabah collection that it's also Minean. It, it shares similarities with the one on the, on the left, Fountain Karit Al Fao. You can see obviously the crescent with the star. It's uh, a, a symbol that has been in, in, in the Near East for, for millennia. The other presence was of Lichianites, which were the, the Dan, the people of the Dan, uh, or the people that inhabited Alula. So we clearly can see those straight routes being present in the, in the site at the time. Um, and it already shows that it's starting to be a cosmopolitan society. Now, at some point, the Minean kingdom is uh, incorporated into the, uh, the kingdom of uh, Kataban. And you can find stella of alabaster, like these ones on the screen in Karet al which shows the appearance of their people. These are traditionally Katabanian in style. And again, I find fascinating that you have at the collection some of the most beautiful fragments that I have ever seen. Uh, the one on the left probably uh, came from Timna, the capital of the kingdom of Kataban. And the one on the right, you still can see what's left from the gold inlay in the eyes. I just find a fascinating figure that definitely is worth sharing and bringing into the conversation of thinking of the, the, the artistic production of these people. We continue in phase number one, which is the influence of the Catabanians. This, this plaque, is a bronze plaque, is written in Catabanian dialect in South Arabian script. And it's possibly an endowment or a votive offering, a wakf of some sort, to the god Wat, uh, it was nailed to a temple. I will show you that later. And you also have several examples of these uh, type of votive uh, offerings in um, at the Al Sabah collection. The ones here on the left are from the Al Sabah collection. Now, what happens when we turn to the millennia is that we find a new substrata of material, and this material is coexists with the South Arabian material, and it's mostly. Greco-Roman. This is extremely surprising in Karet al Fao. Why? This is a question I have been asking myself for a long period of time. And one of my arguments is that it's not only Greco-Roman, it's mostly Egyptian Greco-Roman. You have to remember at this time, Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemies and even after by the Romans, uh, after the invasion by Augustus. So we have material like this wonderful fulcrum. A fulcrum is the headboard of a bed, like this one of a couch. Um, the production of this type of material was extremely expensive. Melting bronze is expensive, it requires a lot of fuel. Here in the middle, you have a scarab in the traditional Egyptian style that uh, contains the inscription of Amunra, and it's from the Ramesid period. This is the year 1200 BC, more or less. So by the time that this arrived to Karet al it was already an antiquity, and you can see that the gold applique was probably later, and it was local. Same thing with this little figure here, which is the god Bess. The god Bess is a deity, an Egyptian deity, that protected uh, pregnant women. Um, what are they doing in Karet al Fao? Here on the right-hand side, it's also a glass vase of Roman style, but you can see the, the, the typical headdress of, the Egyptian, of, of an Egyptian figure with his necklace and with a skirt, and also the god Horus, the falcon god, at the bottom. So, we have a lot of Egyptian material appearing our way in Karyat. In this phase, we also, Karyat is incorporated in the kingdom of Kinda. It probably is telling us something. We find figures like these ones of different classical divinities. On the left, you have Artemis or Diana, goddess of uh, the moon and the hunt. And on the right hand side, you have Hercules, the hero, the mythical hero extremely strong with 12 tasks. That, however, in the middle, you have two little figures, these children, this child pointing to his mouth. This figure, indeed, is the god Harpocrates. Harpocrates is a syncretic deity 
of the Egyptian world is really when the Egyptians, it's a Hellenistic invention, when the Egyptians arrive to, um, when the Greeks, excuse me, uh, arrive to Egypt, they create this figure out of the god Horus, and it's the son of the goddess Isis, and it's protectors of secrets. She was the goddess of love, Isis Aphrodite, goddess of love. She definitely had some secrets to, to, to keep. The Al-Sabah collection has a figure, has actually the one on the left, on, on, on your left hand side, is in the Al-Sabah collection of the goddess uh, Aphrodite. Indeed, this is not only Aphrodite, this is Aphrodite, Isis, the mother of Harpocrates. This statue probably came from South Arabia, or even from the, from the vicinities of Qariyat al Fao. What's surprising is that what tells you that it, this is the goddess Isis in disguise is the crown. The image here in the, in the middle, it's a sculpture from the Museum of Fine Arts in La Ville de Paris. And here on the right-hand side, you have a, a terracotta figurine from the Metropolitan Museum. And pay attention to that crown, that crown of flowers, and also you have it coming down her, her, her chest as well. We'll talk about this shortly. Another piece that I find fascinating in Cario del Fao is this ladle, probably from Mesopotamian origin. So this, this style is traditionally Mesopotamian, Greek Mesopotamian uh, Seleucid. But you have two examples of the Al Sabah collection that are very similar, are wonderful. And there is something surprising in the, in the one that you see here. There is a little inscription, and that inscription contains a name. And the name is Galwan, which is a clan from Qariyat al Fao. We only have documentation of this tribe in Qariyat al Fao. And we have a ladle of the same type in Qariyat al Fao. Certainly, there is something connected to Qariyat al Fao and to the larger world of Qariyat al Fao here. And I find it, I, I really wanted to relate them because, because of the physical similarities and, and, and because of this clan. If we talk about architecture in Qariyat al Fao, we find some, there is not much, as you saw in the images at the beginning, but you can see there is a fresco, this one on the left hand side. By the way, the image on the right is from Marib in Yemen. It's just a reference, because the one on the left is uh, some sort of tower. You can see little figures here at the top, sort of ladies looking through the windows. And what captivated me as well was these figures of ibex in the corners of the building. What's, what is that doing there? It brought to my mind the, uh, uh, right, the writings of Al-Hamdani in the 10th century on the description of the palace of Rumdan, of the, of the governor of Rumdan in South Arabia, what would be nowadays uh, Yemen. And I will read it with you. It was a huge edifice of 20 stories. The four facades were built with stones of different colors. On the top story was a chamber which had windows of marble framed with ebony and plain wood. Its roof was a slab of pellucid marble, so that when the Lord of Gundan laid on his couch, he saw the birds fly overhead and could distinguish a raven from a kite. At each corner stood a brazen lion, and when the wind blew, it entered the hollow interior of the effigies and made a sound like roaring lions. And it also reminds me of the research of one of my colleagues in London, uh, Professor Anna Contadini, who has been looking at some bronze figures of the early Umayyad period in Al-Andalus or Fatimid Egypt. And these are, these are some of the figures, the f very famous uh, griffin of Pisa, or um, one of the deers from Cordoba in Medinat al-Zahra. Professor Anna Contadini has proven, I think quite convincingly, that these statues which had an empty space and an open mouth were likely to allow air to come from some sort of mechanism all the way into the interior and be let out to make some sort of astonishing sound. Um, so these were wonder-making wonder uh, 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 objects. Is it possible that a carietal fowl because of that fresco, we had something like this going on, or even in the palace of Humdan. Certainly, the interconnectivity of the region at the time suggests so. 
I also wanted to bring into the conversation this wonderful piece from the Salah collection. It doesn't have a, a, an interior, an empty hollow interior or, or open mouth to allow sound coming out, but it's possible also that this is the type of fears that we see in that fresco from, from Alfao. Overall, we can say that in terms of trait, Harriet Alfao benefited from a number of influences. And all the objects I'm going to show now on the screen were found in Carret del Fao. We have the influence of Mesopotamia. We have uh, Parthian and Seleucid um, pottery. We have the influence of the Mediterranean Greco-Roman world, like, for example, this little head of ivory, which probably was an attachment for furniture, was found in Carret del Fao. We have the South Arabian material, which we have discussed, and we have the Egyptian content material culture that appears. And I also want to point out, I have not been able to handle this, um, this stone, which has an inscription. It's probably glass. I'm not 100% sure. But I am possibly able to read the name of Serapis, which is a deity of, also a syncretic deity of the Ptolemies. It was the god of Ceres with the god Ipis, um, uh, Apis mixed together. Um, so again, I find it surprising that you have a city in the middle of, of Arabia, in the middle of an oasis, so interconnected with the later late antique world. The last year, um, oh, this is actually the temple. I, I early show you the, the, the plaque, the bronze plaque with a, with a votive inscription. This is the temple of the god Wat, uh, Wat uh, in Karia del Fao. And the last year I have been involved in this other temple, which Probably you can see the, the, the center court with, an, with a building that likely looked like the Temple of Wat. But it has two rooms on each side, a north and a south room, with two columns in the middle of each room, and a long bench uh, running around uh, its walls. So I have reconstructed that temple so far you can get a better sense of how it may have looked like this. Inscriptions reveal this was a marzeach, What's a Marzeach? Marzeach is a very old word. It's an Akkadian word that already by this time had 2,000 years of existence. It's an enigmatic space, but we can summarize it. It probably was a, a space or a congregation, a fraternity of men that got together for banqueting in honor of the deceased. So these were spaces used for funerary practices. If we were to chop the interior the, the, and cut off this, the section, the, the roof of these, these, these structures, we would see the bench that I, I mentioned, which is where you would lay and, 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 and share a meal with your, with your colleagues, and then you will see that the walls have frescoes. Only f two frescoes from these buildings were published uh, in 1982 by Alansari. I was fortunate enough to have access to them earlier this year, document them, measure them, and uh, these are the fragments. The one on the top left is an extremely famous popular one because it has featured in the Roads of Arabia exhibition, but you also find fascinating ones like the one here, which is a camel driver. You also have some sort of figure with a toga. You have, again, some horse chariot over water and a little flying putty or cherub uh, holding the reins of a horse. Overall, the, 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 the set of fragments, what makes it distinguishable is the background of ochre color with these vines and these grapes, uh, scrolling motifs around. If we were to imagine the, how these frescoes look like, we could reconstruct them something like this. Indeed, you start seeing that the whole scene was contained within scrolling vines. You have little figures flying in around containing cartouches. This is indeed not unknown. This is not a type of art that is unknown in the first or second century um, AD. This is, in fact, the art of the late Roman Empire. This is a mosaic floor from uh, the site of El Dijeme in Tunisia. And you also can see a little camel driver there. Again, 
it reminds us of this fresco of Cario Talfao. I also, I love this piece, I just wanted to put it, uh, have it quite uh, in good quality here, just because of, of the strangeness of the figure holding a baby. And of course, I have to talk about the camel, because one might think, oh, this, might be, this is clearly the art of Arabia, it has a camel, it's caravan trade, but not really. I mean, caravan trade with camels existed all over the Roman Empire. These three examples, this is the one in Tunisia, in El Gem, this is from Constantinople, and this, uh, sorry, this is from uh, Palestine and from Constantinople. The last, um, last August, I had the opportunity to present at the Arabian seminar, and I discussed the possibility that these frescoes were likely made by Egyptian painters or local painters well familiarized in Egyptian style or motifs. Why? Because the figure of how they call it Zaki, because of this inscription, which is likely a blessing, this figure has a crown that you only find in the late Egyptian period. This is what's called the crown of justification. It's a symbol of the triumph over the death. You will see that crown in all sorts of funerary motifs of uh, the Roman period of Egypt. You will see it in cartouche. Again, we recognize this figure of the child pointing his mouth. This is the god Harpocrates wearing the same crown, a symbol of Isis, his mother who would grant it to the deceased, uh, the departed, as a symbol of uh, resurrection, hopefully. You, there, there are plenty, and sometimes it's also held in the hand of the, of, of the departed. The idea that these frescoes were done by Egyptian uh, artisans was quite, quite, quite a challenge to justify or to explain. But I started looking at the rest of the Arabian Peninsula and seeing what I could find. And it took me to the palace of Shabwa in South Arabia, in the region a little bit southern of Nashran, where uh, Breton had the fortune of finding two frescoes. There are not many examples of frescoes in the peninsula. And it are these, these two that you can see here on the, street, on the screen. He alleged, he alleged that these frescoes were likely of an Iranian style. However, I personally cannot see the Iranian style. I mean, the Iranian style of the time would have been the late Roman style of the period. But there are certain things that do point to Egyptian styles if we compare it to the localized paints, paintings of the oasis of Egypt, not the, not the very elaborate art, but like this of Karanis in the, next to, to the oasis of Fayum. Also, the fresco on the right-hand side is some sort of figure holding the reins of, of, of a horse. This, in my opinion, also shown by the star that is here behind his, uh, his costume, it's a clear representation of a Dioscuri, which is one of the two divine uh, twins uh, where this, the, the zodiac of sign of Gemini took its form. So I could find this, this little image just as, a, as, as to, to, to show you how the iconography of uh, the Dioscuri uh, operates, which is this, this, this sort of figure holding high up the reins by the, by, the, by the mouth of the horse. Now, there is also, if we think about painting in the Arabian Peninsula, connected also trying to reflect on Qariyat al Fa, what was who were operating at the time, I could take you to the place of Sikel Barit next to Petra. Again, we find uh, a space devoted with, with a running couch or bench, and if I was to show you the interior, and you were to look at the roof, you will find this. Again, a paradise, a scene of paradise. You have these scrolling motifs, vines, and more surprisingly, you have the goddess Isis herself here, looking through the bushes. You know that's Isis because of the, her crown with a solar disk, and the sistrum in her hand, which is her uh, iconographic uh, instrument. So, because of the topological similarities with the Marzeach in Karyat al is it possible that this site was also a Marzeach in honor of Isis? Was it this Nabataean site? Uh, we know that the Nabataeans, in fact, had, were adepts of the Egyptian styles. They fashioned their, their monarchies, like the Ptolemies. They intermarried their sisters and their brothers. 
and they copied the styles. If you were to look at the facade of Petra, the facade of Petra, that style of broken pediments is extremely Alexandrian. You only find it in the north of Egypt at the time. I'm showing you here a reconstruction of the city of Ptolemais in Cyrenaica, just to reflect on this other painting, which was found in Azantur next to Petra, which also shows these broken pediments. And again, this site is probably from the second or the first to the second century AD, and it's slowly showing a development of painting with the involvement or the style or the motifs of Egyptian painters. I'm surprised that when people talk about Arabian painting, they never bring into the conversation the frescoes of Manshit, which are quite late. And you will understand why I'm showing this to you now in a minute. These are probably from the early third century, and they show mythological, Greco-Roman mythology motifs, and have these sort of arches uh, and, and figures hidden uh, and depicted, uh, which is quite a new format. Now, because remember the, 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 the name of this talk is Kharit al Fao, an emporium in between the classical world and the Islamic world. I want to also jump 400 years after the, the, the end of Kharit al Fao and take you to a place which most of you are familiar with, uh, which is Kusair Amra. The site of Kusair Amra was built sometime in the 8th century, early 8th century, probably in between 722, uh, 23 or 743, by Prince Al-Walid ibn Jazid. Al-Walid became, um, he became the caliph uh, under the name of Walid II, Umayyad, Caliph, and he only reigned for one year, from 743 to 744. What's surprising about this site is that it was built in the route that connected uh, Bosra and Damascus with Dumat al-Jandal, and that same route would have continued in ancient times, at the time Karet al Fao was in ruins, but would have continued up to Karet al Fao. Now what's fascinating about the site of Kusair Amra are the frescoes in the interior. These frescoes have been um, studied and overstudied one and other time. I mean, what was surprising about them is that when the first scholars that documented the site approached the, approach, approach the representations, they didn't quite make up, they didn't know what to make up with all this material. Was this a pre-Islamic or was this an Islamic site? Clearly, the images that you see here do point to the larger Roman, late Roman, or even Byzantine, what you call the Byzantine Empire. Indeed, there are inscriptions in Greek, you can see them here, and there are inscriptions in Arabic. Somehow, these images as well remind us of Khariat al-Fao, these, 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 these busts popping out of, 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 of vines and scrolling motifs. In 1898, Henry Lamens was the first one to interpret the site, and he thought this site was a Ghassanid palace. So the Ghassanids were a horrible, Hellenized uh, Christian community that took over the area of the Nabataeans. Then, in 1975, it was Almagro, the Spanish team that restored the site. He also termed the site, uh, the art of the site, as some Arab Islamic art. I think now it's, we cannot contest that this was definitely not a Ghassanid palace. There are inscriptions in Arabic that were done with the rest of the structure. But it, it again makes us reflect on what, why do we find these motifs in Greek and these elements. I'm, I'm here showing the, 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 the structure of Mamshid that I showed earlier uh, before. And I show again the one here. Um, in Kusair Amra. Is it possible that there is a continuity of practice? And this is very important to understand that when the first Islamic dynasties appeared, there was no a break with what existed before. Not necessarily it was a gradual change and evolution, but what continued from their predecessors probably continued after um, the establishment of the Umayyad Caliphate. I want to share with you some of the frescoes, some of the details from the frescoes of Kusair Amra. 
The one on the left is a lady holding her arms quite high up, and the one on the right is a lady or, or perhaps even a male figure holding some sort of cloth in front of, of her. I could show you some elements, some representations that are quite similar, that echo these, these, these elements. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is an Egyptian Roman sarcophagus with the representation of the goddess of the night, Nut. Here, the one on the in the middle and the one on the right-hand side, and we'll sp start with this, is a 5th century representation of the goddess Gaia, the goddess of Earth, holding in front of her a basket of, uh, of fruits, a symbol of, of all the wonderful things that come from the land. The one in the middle is indeed from Castel al Hayr al Garbi, and it's again, this is an Umayyad palace. Why are the Umayyads incorporating all these elements from the late antique world into their, into their um, visual repertoire? This has been explained by most historians as an appropriative act. It was an attempt to claim legit uh, their, their le legitimacy in the region of Bilat al-Sham in Syria by coming to Syria and copying what they saw. This definitely probably happy, happened, but what I'm trying to argue here today is that probably the Umayyads just continued what was in Arabia before their time. There is a site, uh, also an Umayyad uh, site, uh, called Hirbat al-Mafyar, where recently uh, a scholar called Taufik Dadli found in the mandatory archive of the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem a couple of aquarel paintings of um, what seems to be soldiers. And this, again, brings us to the late Greco-Roman world. Um, it, brought me, it brought to my memory a type of painting that we can also find in Egypt. You have here um, the, um, one of the chambers of Luxor, uh, the painted sometime in the 3rd or 4th century, I believe, by a type of painter that was specialized, and we know that because of the comparison with other sites, specialized himself in this type of representations. So I'm just quite intrigued by this element of continuity. So how can we bridge from the last years of Qariyat al Fao in 400 AD, if we take a late chronology, to the beginning of the Umayyads? Can, is there anything that can prove this legacy? Well, it, there are not enough material. Uh, there, are, there is not enough material to prove that there was much more painting at, in, in, in this gap of time. But if we study the records, we will find that wall, mural painting and wall painting did not die out. In the year 608, the Quraysh tribe was entrusted to paint and repair and restore the Kaaba in Mecca. And for that, they contracted um, an artisan that had uh, been set ashore in the Red Sea under the name of Bakum al-Rumi. And by al-Rumi, what this means is that he was the Roman and very likely an Egyptian. Another thing that happened in the period is that uh, Aksum, the, the kingdom that had the empire that had control over what's modern-day Ethiopia, had access, had access and, and established themselves in the southwestern um, part of the peninsula. Because of that, we find a lot of the Christian art of the Aksumites which is, there is nothing left of wall painting from Ethiopia of this period. So I have had to show a medieval wall painting of a modern day church, just to sort of evoke the type of art that must have been in the south of the peninsula at the time. And we even have the, uh, the documentation of Umm Habiba, one of Prophet Muhammad's later wives, who had uh, exiled herself in Aksum in the year 620, and she had praised the walls that adorned the cathedral of Aksum at the time. And we also know that Najran had a large Christian population which had 
churches that were painted as documents and records uh, proof. The point I'm trying to make tonight is that Cardio del Fao does not only provide us with a wonderful, a wonderful capacity for us to look into what the ancient Arabian, late antique Arabian world looked like, but it also allows us, gives us the key to perhaps allow, uh, to, to perhaps let us understand a little bit better what the early Islamic art was. Going back to Qariyat al Fao, indeed, the, the assessment underscores the importance of the site. It was, above all, a cosmopolitan society. It had traders from all over the known world. It definitely challenges this idea of the empty quarter. There, is, uh, there are even academic research, uh, journal uh, articles that speak of the empty Hijaz, the empty, uh, empty Arabia. These are stereotypes that need to be abandoned. These are phantoms of academia. This was an extremely large settlement. They were also active players in the late antique world. And it challenges this idea of a vacuum of culture in the peninsula. Definitely, this is, we, we are only just beginning to scratch the surface of what Qariyat al Fao was. We we're meant to do some more excavations, probably in March, at the beginning of March, there will be a new campaign starting. And I think. The last thing I want to, to share with you is a question that Her Excellency had asked me this morning, which is, why are you so fascinated for Qariyat al Fao? I think Qariyat al Fao not only represents, allows us to, 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 channel, uh, to challenge or, or to reassess the way we study pre-Islamic and Islamic art, but you see, I am an, a, a classical archaeology, archaeologist. Um, from the, I studied ancient Greece and ancient Rome. But I am, uh, I am an art, uh, art historian of Islamic art. I keep seeing connections. What I prove, I hope to prove here, is that Hellenism was one of the many vehicles to convey ideas uh, in the late second, third, fourth century. Not the only one. But if I was to tell any of my colleagues of classicals that uh, of classics that that the Islamic world spurred or had any connection to Hellenism, they would probably look at me confused. When I found the site of Qariyat al Fao, it definitely allowed me to justify to them that when the Islamic world, uh, the, the, the new Islamic dynasties appeared, they were extremely familiar with this, with this broader Mediterranean, Iranian, Egyptian world, and they were key players of this whole um, of, of these whole narratives. This way, Qariyat al Fao allows us to challenge all these stereotypes and misconceptions that keep appearing in academia. So, thank you very much for your time today. I hope that one day you have the opportunity to visit this wonderful site. I know that some of you will be there uh, soon. And uh, I hope that somehow you're able to connect the dots of some of the things that I have narrated today. So thank you so much for your time.